Uh, our next speaker is Professor Mandy Chessel. Mandy or in full, Amanda Elizabeth Chessel is an IBM Distinguished Engineer, Master Inventor, and Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Mandy is a trusted advisor to executives from large organizations, We're working with them to develop their strategy and architecture relating to the governance, integration, and management of information. She's also driving IBM's strategic move to open metadata, metadata and governance through the Apache Atlas open source project, a very worthy endeavor. She was one of 30 women featured in the ebook e entitled Women in IT, Inspiring the Next Generation. So Mandy, the floor is yours and we are looking forward for an inspiring speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got a picture. We've got movement. Excellent. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Now, firstly, what a fantastic start. Um, I think we always talk about privacy as we, we know it's important, but to actually have such a, a well thought through description of exactly what we mean by privacy and why it's so important to everybody um, is actually a fantastic start. So I'd like to go on and start to develop, well, what is the technology that's causing this concern? Why is it causing this concern? And then maybe some sort of, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, and why is it causing so much of a, an issue to, um, you know, sorry, what do we actually have to change in order to make this technology support privacy? Okay. Let's get going. So what are the concerns? What is this new technology enabling <coughs> us to do? And us, I mean, as humans. The reality is that much of how technology is being used has been done before. But what is happening is that we have a, t a technology base that is widely deployed, that is allowing us to get to much more data, to uh, process it in a cost-effective manner and bring sources together and link them. So we can start to see data from different contexts. And, and one of those points was about being, having safe spaces for discussions. So there's a context around every piece of data that's collected. And with much of our technology, that context is stripped away as the data moves. Um, there's great accuracy in terms of how um, an individual is identified. So who is, you know, this, this, this person is using the same mobile phone, they're contacting this service, they're contacting this service, and we can now bring that together because that, that, those requests have come from this individual device, which is one-to-one -one with an individual. Um, we can actually pinpoint the location when things are happening, um, and we can actually kick off no, new activities and actions that actually can come back to us in place. So our um, concentration, we can be interrupted, you might be about to do one thing, and the device tells you, oh, by the way, there's this new opportunity. So we're starting to interfere in everybody, in people's daily lives. So why do we care about privacy? I think Ruth has covered this beautifully. But actually, when you think about our ability to collaborate, our ability to innovate, often you bring together people from very diverse backgrounds. And that diversity enables the innovation. But it isn't that you need to know everything about every person. Generally, what you're doing is you're bringing together common beliefs, common understandings that you share, and ignoring the things you don't. So what you're trying to do is create spaces where people can feel they can trust um, and work together. So there's huge value economically, <laughs> politically, so for our social environment and for individuals' well-being to allow those contexts to exist. So one of the, the things that we need to make sure is that people have trust in the digital services that are being built. Now, trust is a very complex word, um, but when you think about it from a technology point of view, there's, there's the question of, if I need this service, if I become reliant on this service, will it be there when I need it? So the reliability of it. 
Will it protect what I give to that service, what data I give to that service? And is, it, is the organization that runs it open and transparent with what they do with that data? Are they just serving my requests, or are they doing something else with it? So I'm going to focus mainly on um, the final piece. I think there's um, a lot of technology focus on how we make sure that systems stay up 24 by 7, and how we start to secure and encrypt data so that it's only available to specific parties. The, th the third one is really about, it's not a technology thing, it's actually about the way people use technology and where the they think the value is. So that's the piece I'm going to focus on today. Now, one of the things that many companies forget is that their attitude to privacy is very visible to their customers. So when you have um, a website that talks about privacy policy, and you're somewhat offhand saying, oh, by the way, well, if you use my site, um, you have to accept what we're going to do, and you make the ability for people to be selective quite difficult, um, it can create a negative feeling and a lack of trust can build because of that lack of transparency. And there's been research that says that the more transparent an organization is about um, their use of, of data, um, the more likely people are to trust and actually give permission for um, additional uses of, of data. So it is actually in many businesses' interest to actually take privacy seriously as well. Now, imagine a negotiation. So here it says, computer. Um, First, ask the person, who are you? So this is a basic challenge for identifying the, the, the end user. So here's Fred, and Fred comes in and gives you gives the system pass, a user ID password or fingerprint or however it, that the identification is being used. And so the computer goes, well, that's great. Um, I, have, uh, um, I can see that you are Fred, and you can do the following things. And that's normally where the discussion stops. But say there's a further on discussion that says, OK, <laughs> so you now know I'm Fred, but um, I'd like to actually say these are the things that you're allowed to do. And this is the question of consent um, that's going on. Um, and you, know, you can sort of basically say, this is what you can do with my data. This is, uh, uh, these are the functions you can perform, and these are who, where you can share that data. Now, we really don't have a very good mechanism for that final piece. Um, and part of it is, um, when do you ask? How do you make that protocol between the person and the, uh, and, and this, the system uh, workable? But the other is that we don't have time. So if you think about how many hundreds of services that you might use within a single day, um, you, couldn't, you haven't got time to do this interaction um, and actually properly control uh, the... Uh, the, the, the use of your data within these services. The other thing is that often the person isn't there when you're gathering data to, in order to ask permission. So for example, if you log on to a website and you create your own profile, you can start to set up those profile definitions. So that's the user profile details. And it might be you can also then at that point say, oh, you can capture activity about me to do research on your website. So that's a second piece. But when somebody uploads into a service, a file about the employees of their company, for example, those people's data, those individuals whose data it's about, have no ability to provide any permissions around how that data can be used. And we rely on that individual who's doing the upload to actually um, only use that data according to the wishes of the individuals. And then finally, as we put more sensors in buildings, transport, um, you know, in, in our entire environment, and we're inferring pe people's actions and activities based on those sensors, again, you're stepping away even further from the ability to ask the individual about uh, how that data can be used. Now, when we ask an individual, we are putting these requests onto um, a global platform. And the global platform itself is highly... Um, it's very open, it's based on open standards, and you know, it's fairly ubiquitous. And this is what's allowing all these new use cases. It's the fact that pretty much everything you do is connected to the internet, um, there are a set of services around it, and we're all beginning to use these single devices for many aspects of our lives. 
Now, if, for example, we issue a request from a mobile device, for example, what are, who are we sharing that data with as that request comes through? So, for example, while well, it's going onto the device for a start, then it's going across this completely opaque internet, which may involve many third parties passing that data on. Now, we can, we can encrypt it, so we can actually create a, a pipe. Um, and then it goes into the digital service. And for most users, that's it. I'm talking to Facebook. I'm talking to XYZ. But what's underneath is actually quite complex in terms of where it's going and how long it's being kept. So for example, there might be something that's just really about one request, and that data is going to be kept and thrown away. Or it might be that it's all to do with just me, and every time I use the service, it stays with me. Or it might be that it's used across all users of this service to, say, improve the service based on what everybody does. So we're going to make this option more important, more you know, top of the list rather than bottom of the list as a result of that use. But it's all within the service. And that's, I think, again, where people think things are going. But let's start to expand what's really going on behind the scenes. So often digital services have partners. So you, you or sorry, have um, sort of multiple services. So you might sign up for one thing and then there's something else that's very related that's provided by the same company. So maybe that data is shared across a single request throughout my lifetime, my, my use of the service, or the services, or um, maybe it's kept forever. But we've now got to three digital services, but all provided by the same person, the same organization. And now we start to spread it to different packages, um, all sitting on the same infra infrastructure. However, that particular provider might be using multiple cloud services. So we've now introduced the cloud service provider. We might have um, additional business partners that are coming out. And then we might share the data publicly. Now, this is a very simplified view of what's going on behind the scenes in those services. But for most people, this is incredibly complex. And you start to ask them, how long can I keep your data and, and how far can I share it? Um, there's actually an awful lot of people involved in providing that actual service. So we have to think about that process as, 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 as we design a, a technical solution for um, providing some notion of spheres of privacy. Oh, I did one more. What was that one? This is, uh, again, additional um, service providers coming in and business partners involved in, in the exchange. And the interesting thing is that for many organizations, they may not realize that they're sharing data as widely as they are because for many developers, there are fantastic packages that you can download for free and use. And many of them don't realize that one of the things these are doing is actually capturing information and sending it back to third parties that are counting uses of applications, counting, um, you know, sort of access to certain services throughout the uh, environment. So again, I mean, the organization that's providing the service may not even realize that that, that is, uh, is what they're doing. Now let's think about the mobile device. For many people, they use the same device for all aspects of their, their, um, uh, their work. And um, the result is that that device creates an identifier that's attached to data from many different aspects of, of, of life. Um, and that could be our work, health, family, uh, personal interests. Um, and this is, this is, again, what creates the, con the uh, concern. Because if you've ever tried to manage your mobile device and keep these things separate, it's incredibly different, difficult. And even if you have two devices, so you have two phones, one for work, one for, for home, even that is very difficult to keep things separate the moment you want to share something between the two environments. So although it is possible to turn things off and try to manage your privacy in this, in this new world, it's actually incredibly difficult because there's no mechanism for the individual to represent once <laughs> their views on, on, their, on their privacy. Um, and... Uh, the, the, the way that systems are evolving in many organizations is, uh, um, is, is adding to this issue. So um, when we think about the, the mobile device, that's your, what we call a system of engagement. It collects data about an individual and about, it, it, exactly about um, how 
their, their perspective of all your services and the, their broader activity. We have the systems of automation. This is the Internet of Things. So these are the systems that are focused on a location, a particular device, a building, um, a vehicle, or whatever. And this, so this is really capturing what's going on in, in a certain space. We have systems of record. Now, these are the traditional systems that organizations build to manage transactions. So this is how an organization fulfills your promise. So you order something off of a website. The systems of record take that order, deliver you the goods, and take the money. That's the, that's the, the systems of record. So very transactional on how the business is operating. And each of these systems collect um, data that's focused on a different aspect, but they're often very overlapping in the values. And then we have things called systems of insight. This is where machine learning um, algorithms are built, where a lot of um, analytics work's done, where the correlation of data from different sources is done uh, to actually create that bigger picture of what's going on. And again, until we have proper mechanisms for maintaining these contexts in which that data was gathered, as we bring it together, we can um, inadvertently um, cross an individual's uh, own spheres of privacy uh, within, within that data collection. Now, when we think about an individual and what they choose to share with different people, there are more, there, there's a subtlety to it in that we almost have different personas for different perspectives of our lives. So I've tried to represent this as concentric circles, but it's not actually that, that well um, organized. But there are things you would tell your friends and family that you don't tell your work colleagues. Um, and there are things that maybe when you meet somebody for a first time, you might tell them a few things about yourself, but there are other things that you certainly keep private. And then there are obviously even less that you want um, a stranger to know. So this is really what we need to try and Im Im embed, embed into the new technology platforms to allow um, an individual to really start to specify what they want shared in different contexts um, based, on, um, you know, based on their personal view of what is private to them. So when we think about the internet today and mobile devices, they really don't have the concept of this user and their different personas and the way that they want to, to manage that environment. Um, and even and so it's very, you know, it's, you, you've got this uh, <laughs> you, you've got this environment where you have a user ID, but each interaction almost is is independent, or each account you have is is independent. And really, what we want is for the individual and their spheres of concern, the way they want to manage privacy, to have a representative in this internet space that actually can work at electronic speed um, to deal with all those different services to manage effectively the rights management around that person's data, depending on the context that certain services are being used in. Um, we don't have this today. Um, there's been some discussions around it, so um, I don't know if you've looked at something called the hub of all things. Here it's trying to create a service where you manage your personal data and then selectively share it with different services. It's, it's a starting point, I think, in terms of trying to say where can people gather their desires, their information, um, and manage the, uh, their, spheres of, uh, their spheres of privacy um, that uh, um, takes the burden, the, the administrative burden, off of the individual and allows that um, use of these services, but also keeps um, the respects the private the, the spheres within that person's uh, um, within that, that person's perspective. And once you start thinking about having these types of services, you know you you sort of say, well, actually, privacy policies should be machine readable. We should have a way of encoding them. So the Creative Commons people have done a really nice job with um, codifying um, the uh, copyright licenses. Can we do something with privacy to allow some sort of program to help an individual work through different privacy um, statements as they're interacting with services and have this system basically alert them when something's a bit strange and actually manage data exchanges for us? So I would say that this 
is something that's missing at the moment. It's something that could help. It's something that can be done. Um, in, you're not without having to change the whole internet. We're really not going to be able to do that. But it is something that you can start to build ecosystems of trust around an individual's use. So let the cameras go. Okay. <laughs> and so, in summary, privacy does matter to all of us. I think Ruth's explanation is is absolutely for, absolutely brilliant. The platforms that we have today don't support that directly. Um, and that puts a huge burden on the individual to actually try and manage their privacy. And for most of us, we don't have time, we don't have the technical knowledge to do this, uh, nor um, the understanding of the consequences of not doing it. It's, you know, it's a bit of a, a, a gray area for most of us. So actually, we need to start to say, what needs to go into the technology to allow individuals to manage their privacy that is more than um, giving consent to individual services as they're being used. So maybe we need a new type of software component that individuals can use. It needs to be open, an open component that, so you can choose your supplier or even run it at home. Um, and it's not you know, something you have to use with a certain account or a certain type of service. Um, and through that, I think we can start to create an environment where the majority of people can manage their privacy in a way that doesn't completely take over their lives. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, you explained the underpinnings of all this complex system mm -hmm. and why it's so difficult to, to maintain privacy. It would be very nice to have a software that we can trust mm -hmm. that will protect our privacy. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, uh, we have, we have uh, 10 minutes for QA, mm -hmm. and then we are taking a 20-minute break. Okay? The floor is open for questions. Yes, please. Yeah. Please state the name. Karen Young, King's College London. Thank you. Could you just clarify what this um, this interface would do? Yeah. Uh, what I'm not clear about is would it would it infer my privacy preferences? Would it work them out? Would I have to feed in my privacy preferences? That's what I'm trying to get a sense of. So I think initially you'd have to prime it with what you care about, um, and then um, as you got new requests, you know, new statements like, well, this this particular policy is asking, is it okay to do this? And you might say yes or no, and, and, and maybe there are certain conditions. And you know, it, and it's whether you say always allow it or just for this case, for example. So I think it's something that is interacting with you and asking for confirmation. But where you're saying, OK, you can do this, so it's OK to, I don't know, share my, post, my, um, uh, my location with certain services or whatever, then it would just go ahead and manage that data exchange. So, Yes, it really is a personal thing, but it's not just running on your, on your uh, mobile device. It's controlling your mobile device and your use of services, and it has a home somewhere where your data is being properly managed as well. So, so if I understand you correctly, Let's it's, go back to it's this. basically the idea is to really help us give more informed consent. Yes. It's trying to make operational. That's exactly it. Is is it. It is, yes. what happens to our data. And, and also, um, I'm giving you, waved it to talk in the, in the uh, thing. So, and, and also, it's keeping an audit trail of exactly what consent you gave as well. Because you imagine, you're basically saying, I didn't give XYZ consent to do that. Actually, well, you'll be able to, to ask. And then as the new um, EU privacy laws come in, you'll be able to do data retrievals and all that sort of thing through this, this environment. So the, the hub of all things site is not doing these things now, but it's just a very interesting way of turning things around and saying, well, actually, if an individual could manage their data, what would those types of services do? And I, so I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting experiment um, that's... that's uh, um, that's being done by a number of universities to actually say, is this, is this type of service possible? Yes, please. Uh, please state the name. Michael Bernhack, uh, Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law. 
Uh, so some 15 years ago, there was this uh, privacy for platform preferences, P3P, mm -hmm. which tried to do, if I understand mm -hmm. correctly, the same thing for websites. Mm -hmm. And this is going mobile and big data and all of that issues, if, if I understand correctly, the suggestion. And I was wondering about um, anonymity, which was mentioned uh, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Ruth Gavison's uh, talk earlier. Uh, many of the big data companies say the following. Well, we collect the data uh, as part of the service that we, we provide, such as mobile mm -hmm. companies and others, health uh, institutes, etc. And uh, we anonymize the data. And then we do all the big data analysis on anonymized data, and we promise you that it cannot be re-identified. Now, you know, of course, if it can be re-identified, so it's a bluff, and the GDPR and other data protection mm -hmm. laws kick in, and they should follow and apply whatever they are obliged to do. Mm -hmm. But let's assume that, yes, anonymization is good enough. Um, uh, it's never 100%, but it's good. Let's assume, like economists do, that it's good enough, and what would be the privacy implications for this system, in your view? Kind of, is it, will they have to ask for my consent to process my data anonymously, or they don't have to ask for that at all because it's anonymous? So I'm not yeah. an expert on consent, but I of would course. say that the real question comes is when that use of that data tells you that you're out of line with everybody else and shouldn't do X, Y, Z. And that's where the concern happens is when, so, so for example, my power company tells me when my house is set to a higher temperature than everybody else's. And this, this to me is where there is a concern with even using anonymized data in that it's basically, it's using my values to tell me I'm out of line with everybody else. So I think if, if all it was being used for was to manage the national grid, then I would say, I don't care. But if it's actually being used to come back to me and modify my behavior, it becomes more, it does become more of an issue. Um, the other thing is that many businesses are trying to take data from many sources. One of the things this could do, because it's got correlated data about you and you give permission for a certain use, actually you could be giving them pre-correlated data. So there's a chance that this type of environment, if there are enough people involved, could actually save a lot of data hoarding that's going on in businesses now just in case they're able to correlate it at a future date. And this also, I think, is a positive aspect from a privacy point of view. If we can stop companies hoarding data on the off chance it might be useful in the future. One more question. We have time. Okay, then we have a break for 20 minutes. Thank, Thank you. you very much.